Well, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, and uh, let's say welcome to Sebastian here, who is going to take it away. Okay. Hello everyone, and welcome to Eat Lit with OSQuery, uh, effective trade hunting without breaking the bank. First, I'd like to introduce myself. Who am I? My name is Sebastian Provost, and I'm currently the lead security engineer for a company called Beacon. In the past life, I've experienced with building security operations for a fintech company in London as well. I love to travel, and I love to go to the gym as well, both of which only recently were, were possible again. So first, I would like to talk about my motivation for this talk. So what's my motivation? So at present, nowadays, EDR, MDR, XDR, they are seen as the answer, the one-stop shop solution for security for companies to protect themselves. However, because they're seen the answer, lots of companies, they try to um, earn some money in that area of the security industry. So there are multiple solutions. Um, there are more than 20 solutions. Some of the more known ones are Falcon from CrowdStrike, Singularity from Sentinel-1, Carbon Black from VMware, you have Trend Micro, XDR, or it all comes like Cyber Reason, you have Cortex, and so on and so on. But because they reported it as the one-stop shop solution or the answer for security issues, they're also quite expensive. They're quite pricey sometimes. But price doesn't mean anything, because if solution isn't as good as they, are, as, as they say it is, then it's basically a waste of money. So sometimes these solutions, they still miss comment index and payloads that um, can be caught by using open source tools. Um, I want to express that this talk is not to complain about how bad they are. They're actually quite good, those systems. I just want to show how we can help those uh, solutions stay honest and complement them by using open source tools. In this case, OS Query. I want to show how you can combine OS Query and one of these secure solutions to even give better protection to your environments. So what can you expect today? First, I'll go over OS Query, what it is, who created it, and what it can be used for. After that, I'll go over the C2 frameworks, uh, two of them and their payloads, and examples on how they can be caught by using OS Query. When that's done, I'll quickly go over um, how we can set up alerting uh, by using two examples as well to empower our security operation teams. And as last, I'll give you a quick C-trap to, to explain what we've seen today. So first, OS Query. What is OS Query? OS Query is basically an operating system instrumentation framework. It's supported by multiple, it supports multiple operating systems. Some of the more common known ones, Windows, Mac OS, Linux, FreeBSD, but because it's built in um, Golang, it's actually quite easy to compile for um, lesser known operating systems. Um, I think some people even try to compile it for Android, for example. Now, originally it was built by Facebook to um, allow them to give a better view on the state of all uh, of the entire infrastructure across the company. Um, but because it was useful, the, um, um, the, the open source community, uh, Facebook decided to, to um, get it managed by the Linux Foundation. So right now it's managed by the Linux Foundation and supported by multiple um, people in the free time. It's used by quite a lot of big companies like Netflix, Uber, Airbnb. Also for them, they give them a better view um, of the state of the infrastructure across the globe. Now, how does OS Query work? OS Query basically exposes the operating system as a relational database. Um, you can use SQL queries to explore the operating system. Um, you have multiple tables that represent the state of different parts, like processors, kernel modules, files. Small examples are, for example, you can use SQL query to see which Chrome extension are installed or which users are logged in. Almost anything you can imagine from an operating system, you can query with OS query. There are in OS query, although I'm saying now we can look at the different states of the operating system by using SQL queries, there are two kinds of tables. So either have tables that show a current state in time, a snapshot, so to speak, like for example, which files are currently in a certain directory, 
or which current mod modules are loaded, but they also have event-driven tables, like with file events. Um, for example, if, it, if a file gets moved away or uh, a process, a process gets executed, those are event-driven tables. Um, OS query can, um, on Windows, if you combine it with Sysmon, is even more powerful because it can also tie into some functionality of Sysmon. We'll explore this later on as well to show how you can accomplish this. Now, the first example we'd like to show you from Whiskery is um, how you can get a file information. So since Whiskery is, is runs on multiple on different operating systems, you would expect that the output is almost kind of the same. So this example, I'm selecting a file in a certain directory where the file name contains a certain words. As we can see, the output is almost exactly the same. You have a path, directory, file name, we name it. The only difference is between Windows and Linux is the UID field in the table. Because on, Win on the Linux, the UID field basically shows the user ID of the, of the account who owns the file, who's owning the file. Windows, but Win Windows is different. Windows doesn't, the UID, so Windows, the UID is just zero. Another example I would like to show is um, that you can also look at listening ports. Like for example, um, if you if you uh, want to know which processes, no, what ports some processes are listening on, it's perfectly possible in West Query. So basically, you can like in normal SQL queries, you can use inner joins in West Query to combine different tables. And in this query, we're basically saying, give us the address, the port, and some more information from the table listening ports. In the join the table processes based on a field called PID, which sends process ID. Because in the table process and listening ports, we have the same fields. Based on the field, we can, we can lay out the relation and show us more information. And basically, the output on Linux or Windows is again almost exactly the same. We are looking for a process with always query in the name um, or Splunk. And we can see, for example, Splunk is on both operating systems listening port 8089. On, my, on all IP addresses. And then on Linux, we see that OS query is running and it's using um, a socket instead of a listening port. Another example I would like to show is uh, name pipes. Name pipes is commonly used um, if you look at managed actors to um, Process information between two processes to, for example, you have a beacon, for example, and sacrificial process, then you can use name pipes to exchange information between the two. So there's here a bigger difference in Windows and Linux. Um, for example, in Windows, if we say, okay, I want all pipes with, for example, my first name in the name, you can show those pipes. Um, type of pipe with the flags and with the names and everything you can imagine. And however, in Linux, you don't see the name of the pipe, you only see the type of the pipe, the file descriptor and the process ID that the pipe belongs to, nothing else. So there's a bit of a difference. But now we've seen these examples of OS query, what, what, what it potentially can do, we're only scratching the surface of the possibility of OS query. We can do so much more, but given the time limits I have, I can't show you everything, but this should give you an initial idea of what you can do with OS query, and you maybe potentially can start using it to get information to protect your systems even better than you, you, you are already doing. Right now, I would like to go a little bit more into uh, command control frameworks and payloads. So, so what's a command control framework or a C2 framework? It's based in a post exploitation framework. So initially, so for example, um, You've, you've, you're, you're the target of a phishing, of a phishing attempt. Um, and you don't know what a phishing looks like. So you see an email where someone says, can you open this document? It contains information related to a case or some, or some products whatsoever. And by opening the document by accident, you, you don't know that it downloads a payload on your system. A payload gets executed. That's an initial payload that potentially downloads extra information um, or extra code, and that extra code can be from a C2 framework that allows the hacker or the malicious person, whatever, uh, it, it gives them more functionality to do pre-escalation on your system or common execution or some level of movements. 
basically see two fireworks they um, and the payloads they allow you to um, from a distance get more information or um, attack more systems from an from initial um, point of access, so to speak. Uh, C2 frameworks, they work on multiple operating systems like uh, Linux, Mac OS, Windows, you name it. And some of the more known ones, examples that I'll use in my talk are, for example, Empire, which is which originally was a Windows only or a pure PowerShell frame, um, C2 framework, but got extended so it would also work, for example, on Mac OS and Linux. You have Mythic, which is a very, it's like a plug and play, very modular framework. And Cobalt Strike is one of the most known ones, which originally was used a lot by Red Team uh, in the engagement, but nowadays it's also used a lot by, um, by malicious actors because it's so user friendly and so easy to use. Now, let's first look at Empire. Now, Empire is a C2 framework that has a Metsploit like command line interface. This is the, the advantage of this is that if you're already um, used to using Metasploit in any capacity whatsoever, the interface after it's installed for, from Empire will feel a bit familiar, so it will be much easier for you to start using it and to do to, to certain actions in it. Originally, like I said before, it was a uh, it was pure partial C2 framework for Windows. Along the way, they started to expand or extend the functionality. And it's now also compatible with Python. Um, three, um, for example, for Linux and uh, Mac OS. Uh, Empire C2 framework can, de can be deployed in, in multiple ways. For example, with Docker, with Kali Linux, or if you just clone the GitHub repository, you can do however you fit to deploy it. This is just a quick example of how you would, um, in the most simple way, install the C2 uh, Empire. So first you do a Docker pull um, to get the latest image. You create some persistent storage, and then you run basically the, the Docker container that you pulled the first step, the first step. Um, and you use the persistent storage that you defined before, and you map the ports in the container to ports on your host system. And with the result, you can see in the screenshot, you get a like, common line interface, like with Metasploit, it's actually quite straightforward if you know um, if you have already have familiarity with Metasploit itself. It's quite easy to use and quite um, easy to extend as well. So Empire works with stagers. Um, they have different kinds of stagers, um, like the types, for example, with shellcode, with DLL files, PKG files. PKG files are like uh, package files for Mac OS, for example. Or you can use macros uh, for um, a macro stager. That um, you can include in, for example, an Office document and so on. The screenshot shows the amount of the different kinds of stages that Empire basically supports. Um, it even just supports simple bash stage, for example, of a Python installer. Whatever you name it, it is probably in there. And as you can see, it supports Linux or Mac OS and Windows. Another C2 framework I would like to go over, um, you can also. Um, use this example later down the line, is the Mythic framework. As I said before, Mythic is um, quite modular. Um, it's quite modular framework. So it's cross-platform. It works on all platforms. Um, it's a plug-and-play architecture. It's quite easy to deploy. So it's deployed in the backend with the doc container and the front end with a web interface. So you just run the doc container in a command line, and then you can open the web interface in your browser. And from there, you can do all sorts of shenanigans. So how would you deploy Mythic? First, you just clone the repository and you just run a bash script. That's which that bash script basically installs all necessary doc containers. And then you just use the command line Mythic start. And that's it. And as a result, you get a nice interface that looks, it's not similar, but looks a little bit like Cobalt Strike interface. Um, but most of the command control frameworks have interface that have some features that are the same across all frameworks. But it's quite a user-friendly interface with an also quite extensive, uh, with quite a lot of features. So how does Mythic actually work? So it uses, instead of Empire user stages, Mythic uses agents. Um, you have agents made in different languages, like um, um, GXA is like a version of JavaScript for macOS, for example, Golang, Python, c .net. 
and they're quite easy to install. Uh, now, how easy to install? For example, you can use a command line for, for example, to install an agent, the Apple agent, which is an agent for macOS, or to install profiles for HTTP profile, DNS, and, what's, and so on. And all these agents and profiles, all from these functionality built in. But why do I say it's easy to install? Because basically you install, for example, the Apple agent like shown on the screen. And basically it's, it installs another doc container that plugs into the entire Mythic framework. So basically the all agents are different containers that, that run their own, but still tied in a framework, which allows for the plug and play architecture and the, the modularity in the entire framework, which makes it actually quite easy to use. Now, now that I've seen, now, now, now that we've seen two different um, C2 frameworks, I would like to use examples. Let's start with Gdelete. So, there are different ways by using uh, different ways that you can catch malicious actors or malicious processes on the system with or with query. Some of them I will go over are Yara rules, file integrity monitoring, process events or which should be combined with Sysmin, which is actually quite powerful, which I explained before a little bit. So let's first start with Yara rules. Yara rules are a way of identifying malware or files or processes by using rules. Yara rules most of the time is uh, in, in with OS query, works in combination with some sort of file integrity monitoring. Um, basically, you can monitor a directory with certain YAR rules, and if a file um, event is triggered in a directory, OS query will scan that file that is related to the event with all the YAR rules defined in OS query, and then see if it matches any of the rules. Now, during my research for this for this talk, I understood that YAR rules and the file integrity monitoring related to it, they trigger on two file events, create and modify. However, it wasn't triggering in mo on move two. Move to is a file event if you move a file into a directory that you're, that you're monitoring, not out, but into. But because it was not triggering on that file action, of course, it's possible for malicious actors or bad guys to move a malicious file into a directory you're monitoring and then just execute it. But because it didn't trigger on that file event, the bad actor could just stay under radar. So because of that, I created PR in the official repository of OS query. And obviously the version 5.0 will also include the file action move too. So this has been taken care of and the uh, commits you can see as well on the screen. Now, what's the YAR rule actually look like? This is a simple YAR rule I've written to detect uh, shell code for Windows Stager for Empire. I explained, so it contains description, outer, doesn't matter. And then I define two strings that it will trigger on. So if any file that enters the directory I'm monitoring contains do, those two strings, we can say with a certain certainty that it's a shell code for Windows from the Empire C2 framework. So how does it look like when you monitor a directory? Firstly, for example, you monitor Home Shadow, for example. And I move the file Empire difficult into a directory. This will trigger the YAR rule. This will trigger OS query to scan the file with all YAR rules. And because we created a YAR rule to um, detect the specific file, we um, we will get a YAR event. Like the YAR, YAR event is an event-driven table, which creates all events where YAR rules are triggered. And on this screenshot, we can see that OS query saw the Empire DevCon file, and it triggered the YAR rule called Empire Wind shell codes, and it also shows which strings it triggered. Another way of potentially detecting um, malicious actions on system is by just using the very common file integrity monitoring. Um, the, that functionality in West query allows you to monitor directories for file changes. You can use it one directory, but you can also, also use it recursively. So, for example, you um, monitor, for example, the home directory on Linux and say recursively all directories beneath, beneath as well. This can be quite powerful, actually. This can be used to, for example, monitor extensive directories like user bin directory on Linux. 
this one triggers on the move to functional or move to file event as well. This basically tells us that the file integrity monitoring in the R rules functionality is created differently than this file integrity monitoring that's the that's in the main functionality for OS query. Now, what does this look like in configuration? So this is part of configuration defined for OS query. Here you can show that, for example, I want to monitor the TIM, the TIM directory, my own workspace, and on macOS, all launch agent directories, because they are used sometimes to hide malicious launch agents that might launch upon boot on macOS. And by using the two uh, percentage signs, I tell it um, to monitor recursively. So all subdirectories under a directory I'm monitoring as well. Now, what does it look like um, when it's getting triggered? So for example, as in, in the configuration you saw that I was trying to monitor all launch agent directories on my on the Mac OS. So when someone potentially saves a malicious launch agent in one of the directories, the file degree monitoring functionality of this query will trigger. And this will show events again in a file in an event-driven table called file events. And on the screenshot, you can see that originally I create a malicious launch agent with the name com defcon software .plis. And because it triggered this file monitoring, this event saved in a query, and later on we can potentially put alerting on that and say, hey, here's a malicious file, do something with it. Another way of potentially detecting bad actions with OS query is by using process events. Again, this will be with an event-driven table. So what process events, um, what, what's the functionality in OS query that allows us to do this? OS query can monitor process execution based on the find um, queries you, see, you use it yourself. It can look for both parent and child processes. Um, and two examples in, in the past, there are two malware families called Hidden Lotus and Limpire that on macOS both use, for example, OSA script to execute certain actions. OSA script is kind of like the PowerShell equivalent for macOS. And um, both, both families use OSA script in the, uh, in the command line to execute certain actions. So if you can monitor process events or post executions from OSA scripts, you potentially catch those both those malware uh, families. What does this look like in the configuration? Uh, this, for example, a query we will run every sixty seconds that look in the process that looks in a process events table for a command line with the letters OSA. This might potentially indicate that someone is using OSA scripts to execute certain actions. Normally, this is um, almost never done anymore, so we can see with certain certainty that if someone uses OSA scripts, they have potential malicious intent. As an example, like I said before, we defined query to run every six seconds to look for potential process events for uh, OSA script execution. Um, so when the malicious actor execute OSA scripts, this will train events, and the screenshot shows what this event and the post events table will look like. Here we can see the process ID, the path, and the mode, and the command line. This command line basically tells, tells us that I, myself, use OSC script to download the payload from the Mythic Apple agent on my system. Now, if you had some alerting, you would be able to alert on this and say in general, like, well, um, there's a problem. Someone you execute OSC script, potentially the malicious, we need to act on this. Now, the last example I want to show is um, OS query combined with Sysmon. Um, this can be quite powerful. Now, Sysmon allows you to monitor your Windows devices um, for certain events based on configuration you define yourself. Um, this, can be, um, this, can, this can be very custom configurations. So one of the advantages of Sysmon, it stays active across reboots. It looks and monitors system activity. Uh, some examples that it monitors for are process injection, create pipe. However, I found out it doesn't uh, monitor user APC calls. So process injection um, can be done by, for example, using the functionality create remote threads in Windows, which basically creates another thread for a certain process, uh, which can be uh, detected by Sysmon. 
However, with user APC calls, you can basically attach yourself to an already existing thread of a process, to an already existing process, without creating a new thread. This basically allows you to fly under the radar and will be detected by Sysman. Now, all these events that Sysman detects are being saved in the uh, event level windows under the um, channel called Microsoft Security Sysman for slash operational. Now, how is this powerful combined with, with Obiscary? Obiscary can basically tap into, in the, into the Windows event channel, events channel that you define, for example, the Sysman one, and it can receive every single event saved that channel in, again, an event-driven table. Now, how would something like this look like? Basically, you find a good configuration from Sysman somewhere online. The one I shown here on the screen, the, the link is a good default config. And then Obiscary, you launch Obiscary with a very specific flag that's, that, that tells Obiscary, monitor the Microsoft Windows Sysman for slash operational channel, for example. And then in Obiscary, you basically say, show me all Windows events where event ID is not 10 every six seconds, for example. And it will show them in, um, it will, okay, how, my, my, my apologies. It will basically write the result of this query in a log file, and which you can then use, for example, the data on the line for alerting. Now, an example is from Google before is create pipe. So as I said before, earlier in this, in this talk, is that sometimes bad actors or um, use named pipes to exchange information between two processes. For example, a cobalt strike uses pipes, named and unnamed. Um, it uses this communication between its beacon, its main beacon, and sacrificial processes. For example, it has a named pipe to launch the shell code. Now, so if a sysman looking uh, monitoring for system activity or for events that where pipes are created or closed, and we have always query tapping into the events channel and saying, okay, gather information. And then we, for example, query saying, okay, um, state everything from Windows events, where event ID is 17, which is the event ID for a great pipe. This is what you would get. You would get information like what's the source, um, what's the provider name, what's the device name where this happened, what's the event ID, and for example, um, what's the pipe name. And also what's the um, the image, the image you see here in the screen is basically the binary that created the pipe. The reason allow you to alert on the create pipe functionality and, and so on and so on to detect pipes created by, for example, a cobalt strike or the processes that you use to communicate between different items in the computer. Another example I want to show is uh, process injection. For this, as an example, I'll use the mythic agent from uh, the Apollo mythic agent. Because it basically uses process injection to execute certain tasks. Um, as an example, I ran mit the mythic framework and agent myself. And I told my agent, um, look, um, use the toolbox that exit binary to inject yourself in that process, and then take a screenshot of my screen. A toolbox that exit binary is a binary from JetBrains for all their IDEs. Um, and as a result, of course, Sysman detected that. And what you see on the screen is basically the result that you see with Obiscary. So basically, it shows us the technique ID from the Mitra attack framework, which is T1055. And the technique name is process injection. It also tells us in which binary this has been um, injected and by which process. So basically this is, again, quite powerful if you want to detect post injection with Sysman and then use Obiscary to uh, gather all information and set up some alerting or anything you can imagine. Now, last bit is, so we've seen how we can detect bad actions with using Obiscary. Um, as an example, I use some, some community control frameworks. We've, we've seen file integrity monitoring, we've seen process injection, we've seen uh, main pipes, how to detect them, or which are rules. But just the them is not enough. We also need to do something with them. So then we come to the to step alerting. 
So the next step, of course, in the process is alerting, um, because detection is only a small part. And we want to empower our security teams to be able to do something with information gathered by Oweskery and Sysman. Uh, I will show two small examples using uh, Splunk and Elasticsearch for this. Now, this is what a very simple pipeline could look like with Oweskery, Splunk, and for example, Slack or PageDuty, where the alerts end up. So you have your endpoints that contains, for example, Oweskery binary and a Splunk forwarder. Oweskery saves your results in a log file, and a Splunk forwarder basically constantly monitors this log file and sends the data from a log file to a Splunk instance. And then that Splunk instance, based on certain queries that uh, is running scheduled every so many minutes or hours, can then send alerts to, for example, Slack or page DoD. This one was like, so the first screenshot shows an event again, like you've seen before on OS query. Then in Splunk, we have a defined query that basically runs real time. So the moment an, an, an event comes in, it runs the query, and if it's, the query has a result, it will send an alert to Slack. And on the right screenshot, you can basically see what an alert on Slack potentially might look like. And if your security operations team sees this alert, it knows we need to act on this because something pretty malicious is happening. Another, another example I would like to show you is um, alerting pipeline with um, Elasticsearch and Kibana instead of Splunk. So basically, this pipeline exists out of four elements. You have your endpoint, where you have Oweskery and Filebeats. You have Elasticsearch and Kibana. And then as an end result, you have, for example, it's like a page duty where the alert end up on again. So in, instead of having an endpoint with Oweskery and uh, Spring Forwarder, you have now Oweskery and Filebeats. Again, Oweskery sends the results in a log file, which would be monitored by Filebeats. Filebeats sends the information to Elasticsearch. And then Kibana can alert on received events on Slack or page journey. This is what it looks like. So on the right screenshot, and then left screenshot, we see an event from always again, which is basically uh, an event from a trigger on a YAR rule. Now this, because of file bit, this will be sent to um, Elasticsearch. And then middle screenshot, you see how we can find alert in Kibana. Um, and then this alert, if it receives an event, this rule, if it receives an event, we send it in this example straight to PageDuty, as you can see in the right screenshots, with, where an alert was triggered based on a received event. Now, we should know two very simple uh, pipelines that you can use to alert and to empower your security teams. Um, of course, there are much more ways to do this. These are just two simple examples. I want to show you how you can do this to start empowering your security teams. So. What would be the next step be? Um, we've seen detecting certain events and alerting, but sometimes you can create alerting fatigue by sending too much alerts to your security teams. So next step potentially could be SOAR. SOAR stands for Security Orchestration Automation and Response. We have different solutions like um, Phantom, Cortex, Alien Vault, and so on. So basically allows you to automate actions that are otherwise executed by your um, security teams. For example, if you have an event on the Windows device that's of severity high or critical, then the SOAR platform can automatically isolate the device until you're there to minimize, to mitigate potential um, risks. The, 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 the functional, the capabilities are much bigger. You can do almost anything with SOAR platform. And this basically improves the quality of life for your security operation teams so they can focus on other items for their work on other things they need to do, instead of constantly looking at alerts. This also prevents alert fatigue from happening too much to your teams, and this will also keep them more happy. Um, so what do we have seen today? We've seen what is always growing. And after that, we've seen, we've, we've dived a little bit into C2 frameworks and the payloads, and how we can potentially detect them with using OS query and Sysman. After that, we've seen a short, a short example of alerting pipelines, how you can be used to send the events we've detected to security teams. And I've given a very, very quick intro in store platforms. I would like to thank you all for uh, listening in to this talk. Um, if you have any questions, you can always contact me on one of these items. 
Um, and thanks for listening all, and I hope you enjoy the day. Fantastic. Uh, well, thanks very much. Uh, <laughs> uh, I am not seeing any questions directly in the chat. So yeah, that, uh, we'll see. <laughs> So technically we are on break for the next 10 minutes. But, uh... Perfect. Was it any, was it in, um, are we still streaming at the moment? Yes, we are. Uh, <laughs> if you do have any uh, direct questions, uh, I'm just going to throw you a follow on Twitter and please DM me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, people are saying that it was a lot to take in, so that does mean that there was some content, and that uh, that content was, well, I found it interesting, personally, uh, <laughs> a bit chaotic to handle this and the entire chaos of uh, yeah. besides the castle, but it was actually uh, quite nice. Good to know. Yeah, I uh, understand it's quite a lot to take in, because it's quite a lot of content basically for, for one talk. We're here for right? <laughs> learning. Fantastic. So, um, you mind telling us your Twitter again? What? Your Twitter. Um, Stx. S T E. K K Z. Um, wait, maybe I can. Oh yeah, we already follow each other. Oh, yeah. yeah. Send you <laughs> there we go. It's easier if I can just show on screen. Clean contact. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> definitely uh, we get all the feedback that we got uh, to you and uh, the DMs. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, on that note, yeah. someone else has entered the waiting room and I am not seeing any questions. So, <laughs> no problem. Um, well, thanks for listening. <laughs> Thank you.